Good afternoon on this beautiful and sunny Sunday afternoon. I thought I should address a couple of issues with regards to the launch of the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance and some of the responses that I have encountered. I must admit that some of the attacks that there had been on Areta had been very myopic, very narrow-minded, and not taking into consideration the very well-intended objectives with which Areta was launched. Let me re-emphasize again. The African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance is a broad-based alliance built on agreement between a large number of people who have expressed their views that such an organization is required, not only on social media, but in many different networks of our South African society. The view was that it is of absolute critical importance that there is a need for an urgent intervention in order to address the destruction of our economy and, in general, the destruction of our nation. Among those that we consulted with, there was indeed consensus that the current rogue government that we have the failed administration of Cyril Ramaphosa is destroying the future of our nation. And therefore, an urgent intervention was required. That is exactly the context within which the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance was born. It was born to address this emergency that we are faced with, and to come up with a minimum plan of action on how to save our nation and how to build a broad and united alliance amongst all of those on the left in South Africa, on the progressive spectrum of our nation, whether it's the political parties or civil society organizations, in order to save South Africa and to do so in the context of advancing the radical economic transformation of our society. This is based on the understanding that at the critical essence of what is wrong in South Africa is the strangle grip that white monopoly capitalism and imperialism has on our economy and on our social economic development in general. So the understanding is very clear. The prime enemy, the main enemy to deal with is white monopoly capitalism here in South Africa and imperialism international. So I've been amazed by some of the attacks that have been launched on the formation of the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance. Attacks by people who should indeed have a better understanding of their own best interests. People who attack an organization, a movement, and broad united alliance that is meant to also save them from the utter destruction that we are heading towards. This is myopic. This is idiotic. But yes, there it is. There are those who swallow hook, line, and sinker. The propaganda of the white monopoly capitalist mainstream media who believe all the lies, who truly think that the new liberal economic disaster, the help that has been created over the last 28 years, 
by the African National Congress increasingly having sold out to neoliberalism and to imperialism, that that is their salvation. It boggles the mind. It truly boggles the mind. How anyone, especially those in the African and specifically in the African community and in the black community, can believe this. But yet there are apparently those who have, with the propaganda that they've been bombarded with, the, the tsunami of negative publicity against those who want to fight this imperialism and new liberalism, who've swallowed it. And who now believe that their salvation rests indeed with a new liberal economic policy program. These are the people who speak out openly. Some of them who even define themselves as my enemy or the enemy of Areta or the enemy of anyone who opposes this disastrous new liberal social economic monolith that has been introduced in South Africa. But okay. These people, they are our enemy. And I can understand and face and fight an enemy. What I find far more difficult is to deal with the cowardice and the silence of so-called friends. Those who know very well that the current new liberal economic policies in South Africa are an utter disaster. Those who can see how our state-owned enterprises are being destroyed deliberately. How there's a deliberate program to eventually decommission and destroy ESCOM and destroy energy security for our nation. They know it. They are knowledgeable about the situation. They understand what has been going on. They have watched it from close quarters over many years. Some of them are right there inside the governing party, but they know that it is wrong. Privately, on the sidelines, in quiet corners where they cannot be seen by others and do not feel exposed, they talk, they say it is wrong. They tell you our country is being destroyed. But when the time comes to speak out, to grow a backbone, to stand up, they are silent. And when you engage with them, they will tell you, oh, I'm strategical, I'm careful, I'm trying to work on the inside. Well, well, that inside is so deep. That underground is so undercover, underground, that no one sees it. Because you see, there is no medicine and there is no salvation for cowardice. I repeat, there is no medicine and there is no salvation for cowardice. Because a coward can always find a good strategical reason or a good reason in terms of his or her financial well-being or the care that is required to those that are dependents around him or her. Not to do what must be done. You see, the worst thing that you can do is when you know that something is wrong. When you know that your country is being destroyed. When you understand the reasons for this huge chasm between the rich and the poor, the biggest in the world. 36.5% of unemployment. One out of every three South Africans 
without a job. When you understand the reasons why the petrol price is as high as it is, while it could be lower if proper arrangements are made with our BRICS partners. When you understand why ESCOM is destroyed and why A-grade coal is being exported while our own coal power stations get the worst coal and while energy insecurity is deliberately being manipulated and created with all the load shedding that we are being subjected to and all the devastation that it causes to our nation. When you understand all the reasons for that, but you remain quiet. Because you say, look, guys, I know it's wrong, but I need my salary check. I need to pay the bond on the house and the installment on the car. My wife will not allow me or my husband will not allow me to do this because we need the man. You see, this is always possible to argue. And that's why I'm saying, for those who are cowards, there's always a way out. There's always a reason to remain silent. I posted on social media this morning and I truly meant it. I can forgive my enemies for their attacks. But it's far more difficult, if not impossible for me, to forgive my so-called friends for their silence. And then, of course, there are those, when you campaign in order to promote an organization such as the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance. When you link it historically and quite correctly with the historical heroes, icons of the struggle for liberation, you say, we stand truly by the ideals as Areta, by the ideals that comrade Chris Hani stood for and for which he was assassinated. We stand by the ideals, the revolutionary ideals, that comrade Steve Biko was detained, tortured, and brutally killed for. We stand by the ideals that Mama Winnie Madikazela Mandela was so viciously character assassinated for by Stratcom because she was not prepared to compromise her principles. Because she was not concerned about the salary check. Because she made the sacrifices and her two young girl children, together with her, had to face the consequences of her courage. When you say all of those things, when you identify with those liberation struggle icons, I vote, then the attacks come, even from those who you thought were your friends. How dare you associate yourself with these great leaders? Aren't you arrogant in doing so? No, there's no arrogance. There's true association. There's a historical acknowledgement of the roots where our ideals come from. The reason why we are called an African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance. I've said so before, and I will say so proudly. The ideals for which and with which I joined the African National Congress in 1979, in June 1979 in Botswana, 
are exactly the same ideals that have driven me and other fellow comrades to launch the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance. I've dedicated my life for 43 years to those ideals. I've never changed. My words, the posture that I've taken with regards to what is required for liberation in South Africa has never changed. I've been absolutely consistent. And the formation of Areta is a consistent expression of exactly, exactly those very same ideals. So yes, I'm proud to associate these ideals, the objectives that we've expressed in Areta, also in our 10-point plan, both in the short document and in the more expanded document. I'm proud to associate those also with Comrade Chris Hahn, with Comrade Steve Beagle, with Mama Winnie Marikazela Mandela, with Mama Helen Joseph, with all of those great revolutionary liberation icons. Yes. I know some of those leaders. I've been with them in the trenches. I have known them as my fellow comrades and friends. A couple of days before Chris Hani was assassinated, I was together with him on the stage in Boxburg, where he severely and strongly criticized the negotiations of Codessa, where he raised his concerns that those were a sellout set of agreements that were being concluded. I shared those views that he expressed. I've known Comrade Harry Guala, the Lion of the Midlands, very well. I've shared his commitment to fight for his people, to stand up against the third force, which was expanded and rolled out in most of KwaZulu-Natal in conjunction with the Inkata Freedom Party and the apartheid security apparatuses and their third force activities. I sat in meetings where Comrade Harry Guala explained very clearly to the leadership of the African National Congress why it was necessary to stand up and fight. And he always explained what he was saying, not just in terms of the immediate war, in terms of that immediate need to resist the third force that was being unleashed on the people of KwaZulu-Natal and also in parts of Gauteng and other parts of our country. He also explained it in terms of the way in which economic liberation was being undermined. And of course, Comrade Harry was going to do that because he was truly in bone and marrow, a radical and a communist. I sat in meetings where he berated President Nelson Mandela, where he walked into the office of President Mandela on the 14th floor on what was then Shell House, a beautiful big office, and Comrade Harry stood there with his arms paralyzed in the middle of that big, huge expanse of an office. And he said, Madiba, I can see why you do not want to fight. You are sitting here in the lap of luxury. I didn't hear that. And what Comrade Harry said to Madiba, third hand or second hand, I was there. 
I sat in that same BT, in that very same office of President Nelson Mandela. I loved Mama Helen Joseph. She was my comrade and my mentor. I literally sat at her feet at her house in Fanny Avenue, Norwood, getting her great lectures, her historical interpretation of our liberation struggle, telling me about the great leaders that she worked with, helping me to understand the context of our struggle. I had spent many a day with Mama Helen. I've kneeled together with her on Christmas days in front of a very humble wooden cross with the prison letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer opened in front of us. And together with her, we read out those prison letters in a remembrance of the prisoners in Robben Island and in other prisons who were political apartheid regime prisons. We prayed, we cried, we laughed. I sat next to Mama Helen at her hospital bed on the 25th of December 1992 when she breathed her last breath exactly at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. It was at what is now known as the Helen Joseph Hospital. Then it was called the J.G. Strader Hospital. I spoke at the funeral service of Mama Helen at the St. Mary's Cathedral in central Johannesburg. But now there are those who tell me I should not say that the same ideals that we promote in the African Radical Economic Transformation Alliance are those ideals that I learned at the feet of Mama Helen Joseph those ideals that she dedicated her whole life to, up to the age of 87 when she passed on. There are those who say to me, you cannot use the image of Mama Winnie Marikazela Mandela and say that the same ideals that you now stand for and Aretha stands for are the ideals that Mama Winnie suffered so much. But I've been there. I sat so many a night into the early morning hours at the home of Mama Winnie, talking to her, holding her hand, engaging, crying, feeling the pain of the vicious attacks that were being launched against her even by her own comrades, by Cyril Ramaphosa, by Sidney Mafumadi, by Frank Chika, by those in the so-called Soweto Crisis Committee that had one aim, but to destroy her legacy. I shared her pain and cried with her when she was brought in front of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission by Desmond Tutu, and he demanded of her to apologize for things she had not done while he was allowing the apartheid apparatchik, some of the worst criminals of the apartheid regime and of the security police, to go scot-free, to be given amnesty and indemnity. I was there. I was there until the last days of Mama Winnie's life. I always stood by her. But today, 
There are those who say to me, you cannot use the image of Mamogun. There are those who were probably not even born during the days of what I've just related now. One to tell me that I've betrayed Mama Winnie Marie Kazela Mandela. And some of them will say they're even friends and allies. You see, there's nothing as treacherous as a so called friend. There's nothing as treacherous as a double talker and a coward. The list of people, of heroes, of iconic struggle heroes that we have listed that Areta identifies for and the ideals that Areta is with and identifies with them includes also Robert Subukwe. Jafta Masamola, Miriam Makeba, Bayer Snudir, and all the other names that I've already mentioned. These leaders do not belong simply to one political party. There were those in the ANC who said, these are our leaders, as if they've got ownership of the no, they belong to our liberation struggle. They belong to our nation. And this ANC, this betrayer of the ideals for the full liberation of our people, this ANC that is being led by Cyril Ramaphosa, this hollowed out, dead ANC that has become a Trojan horse for new liberalism, Surely certain, this thing cannot claim these liberation icons. So you see, my dear friends and comrades, when I speak this afternoon, I speak with some passion because I feel the pain. I feel the frustration of those who are betrayers, who cowards, who are without a backbone. But one thing I want to say unequivocally and unapologetically, I will not put distance between myself and those that I lived with those with whom I've been part of this liberation struggle, those incredible, amazing comrades of integrity, of courage, of backbone, who knew when it was necessary to speak out and stand up and fight and who were prepared to pay the price. They taught me. To them, I have a loyalty more to, than to anyone else. In their image and in their dedication, I must live my life. No matter what the cost, what the pain, what the price. I've watched them paying the ultimate price. I've seen Comrade Chris Hani's body lying lifelessly in that pool of blood in the driveway of his house. I felt the last life seeping out of the bony, emaciated hand of Mama Helen Joseph as I was holding it there on her hospital bed. I've seen Comrade Harry Guala, handicapped as he was, paralyzed as his arms was, fighting harder, standing stronger, being a giant, being truly the lion of the Midlands, despite his illness. 
I've watched the pain in the eyes of Mama Winnie Marikazela Mandela. I've watched how the betrayal was deep in her heart eating her, but how she never compromised and how she always continued to remind us what the struggle was truly about. I remember the history of Robert Zubukwe, who was imprisoned even without a proper trial, who was kept in prison until the day that he died. I've gone to the old age home in his last years where Dr. Bayer Snowdeer was living. I sat with him in that small living room when he was very ill. And I heard him in his shaking voice saying to me, and I'll say it in Afrikaans, Marcaro, who kom laat madiba tu, dat ons land uit verkoop word. But Carl, why is Madiba allowing for our country to be sold out? I've seen the consternation in the face of Tabu Mbeki. When in the last days of Mbeki's life, when Mbeki was very ill, and he was lying in the medical section of the old age home where he was staying. And Tabu arrived there. And Umbay pulled himself up and he looked at him and he said, What are you doing here? I've never seen you in years. Shouldn't you rather be making right all the things that you are doing? You see, my dear comrades, I'm not talking from books. I'm not talking from stories. I'm not talking from other people's narrations about this history of ours. I'm talking from first-hand experience. I spoke at the funeral of Umbay. I narrated what Umbay stood for. In that eulogy that I gave, I also said that Umbay was deeply concerned that the ideals that he was fighting for against apartheid, the true economic liberation that he was hoping and thirsting for, was being betrayed. As we walked out of the church, behind that very, very simple, humble pine wood coffin that Umbe insisted on, that he had to be buried in. One of the senior comrades of the ANC came behind me and took me very harshly on my arm said to me, how dare you say this here in this funeral service of Dr. Nodier? And I turned around and I smiled at him. And I said, that is exactly what I had to say. Because that is what Umbe asked say. So comrades, as I'm sitting here today speaking to you, recalling these experiences of my life, 
providing some of the insights about why. We are using the particular images and names of those liberation struggle icons in calling on you to be part of this great project of salvation, of the saving of our country that Areta is about. I do so with the utmost conviction. And I started off by saying that I wanted to address some of the issues that are weighing heavily on my heart. Some of the things that are being done by those who call themselves friends and perhaps even more tragic. All the things are, are not being done while it should be done by those who call themselves radical and our friends. I'm not doing this, I'm not speaking like this to condemn anyone. I'm talking truly with a sense of disappointment. But yes, I suppose also with hope against hope. That those who will listen to this recording will understand the message that I'm trying to convey to all of you and also especially specifically to them. will hear me will find in their deepest hearts, in their souls, the unease coming out. The flame that has been doused to begin like an ember, like a coal when the wind blows and it starts to again burn, to burn up again inside because ultimately the message continues to be to everyone even those who have been cowards even those who have been running away even those who cared more for their salary checks than their ideals their principles to come back to join us to be part of this great mission, this great struggle that we have absolutely no compromise to make with, that we have no way to escape. If we want to see liberation, we must fight, and we must fight now. So my dear comrades, I call on you once again, join us. Yes, take up the spear. Regain your courage and fight. Aluta, continue.